Hi, welcome to this afternoon's so lecture series. <laughs> I want to first thank the sponsor, MRV Architects, and we have some series friends who are also sponsors, McDowell Group and Kathy Ruddy. We appreciate their participation. I want to take the opportunity today, and I appreciate the opportunity to introduce Rosita Whirl. Dr. Rosita Whirl received her PhD in anthropology from Harvard University and taught anthropology and ANSCA courses at UAA and UAS. She has extensive academic background and is widely published. She has also received national and statewide awards for her, for her work. In 2008, the National American Anthropologist, Anthropological Association bestowed upon Dr. Whirl the prestigious Solomon T. Kimball Award for Public and Applied Anthropology. Dr. Whirl is also featured as an anthropologist of note as, as an applied anthropologist in the text Cultural Anthropology, The Human Challenge. In addition to her leadership on Alaska Native Corporations and organizations, boards, Dr. Whirl has spent decades studying ANSCA. From 1982 to 1987, she was publisher and editor of the Alaska Native Magazine, which examined Native issues on a state level. Additionally, from 1988 to 1980, 1983 to 1985, she served as a special advisor to Thomas R. Berger and, As and Alaska Native Review Commission to re-examine ANSCA. More, more recently, Dr. Whirl has been involved in an NSF grant which seeks to measure and understand the impact of Alaska Native Corporations today. That is the written word on Dr. Whirl. I want to take just one minute to talk to you about the personal human oh side of her. Dr. Whirl and Dr. Rosita Whirl and I, before she was doctor, attended Alaska Methodist University together. We graduated together in 1973. The note here is that she attended the University of Alaska and Univer Alaska Methodist University almost at the same time and was able to graduate in a very short period of time. She started her career in education pretty late, actually. Had children already when she went to college. Received her degree in 1973, the same year I did. And our keynote address speaker that year at Alaska Methodist University was do, uh, Dr. Walter Sobola. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we were re really privileged then to have him uh, be our keynote speaker. She went on to become a student at Harvard, which in itself is noteworthy. To become accepted at a prestigious university in America, like Harvard University, has to be recognized as an achievement. But to also get a PhD in anthropology from that prestigious university is also noteworthy. And very few of us have ever done that kind of academic work, and especially someone like her to have not only done the work, but to have exceeded and done awfully well in it. She has followed in her Clinkett tradition as being a great orator. In the last, since I've known her, she has grown tremendously in her oration. And it's really uh, something that those of us who are from Clinkett descent are very proud of, is that our tradition, Clinkett tradition, has been an oration tradition, and she is very, very well uh, versed in that, in that area. I really appreciate Dr. Whirl. She has been a leader not just in anthropology, but in the state, Native Association in the state, in itself, in issues that are important to all of us. So would you please welcome Dr. Rosita Whirl. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Thank you very much, Albert, for that very kind mm -hmm. introduction. Uh, I'm reminded that when we were at AMU walking up the aisle to get our diploma, I think we were fighting then, and uh, sometimes we still continue that, sometimes in public as we uh, forget <laughs> when we have our differences of opinion. I'm also reminded that uh, about the written word and oral traditions, when I first um, became enthralled with the idea of writing, uh, I was doing an introduction for the Marks Trail Dancers for the Wicker on the Wickersham. And I'd written out my introductions, and I lost my place. And people said all they could hear on the on the uh, radio was my clink, crinkling of the papers while I looked for my place. So I've become very dependent on the written word. Uh, today we have a very complex um, uh, topic, and um, and and to try to address it in. 45 minutes or so is also very complex, but I'm going to try to do the very best that I can. What we'll do is move very quickly through the first part and then spend a little bit more time on really talking about assimilation. But first, if I could, uh, in honor of my ancestors and in love for my children, my grandchildren, I would like to introduce myself to you in my Clinket traditions. Clinket chay nach yedekhtetzak ka kahani aksayi. 
Shangu Kredi Ka Jak Nahat Sati, Kaudli Ayi Hit Ayahat, Jilkat Kwan Ayahat, Sukahadi Yadi Ayahat. My Tlingit name is Yadeklazak, and my ceremonial name is Kahani. I am uh, of the Thunderbird clan of the Eagle Moiety, and I am from the House Lord from the Sun in Klakwan, and I'm very proud to be a child and grandchild of the Sockeye clan. Um, you've, you've heard that I, I've done a lot of research on, on ANXA many, many years, um, and, but this particular research project is the same project as uh, the one that Dr. Tom Thornton talked about when he was here a couple of weeks ago. It's a National Science Foundation uh, study. Uh, we're comparing the Bering Straits region and Sea Alaska. We're looking at four major components that are identified up here. And in this uh, address, I will be looking at the fourth component, cultural conservation and revitalization strategies. And specifically, I will be focusing on the question of assimilation. Um, to assess the question of ANCSA's impact on, on assimilation and the cultural survival of Indians of Southeast Alaska, I will review, first of all, the following principles. The legal principles and policies governing Alaska Natives, uh, the responses of the Tlingit and Haida to colonialism, and then Alaska Natives' initiatives to integrate Native values into ANCSA. Uh, but first of all, let's take a look at what is assimilation. Uh, assimilation is a process of change in which a culturally distinct group adopts the patterns and norms of the larger society and abandons its cultural traditions. That's what assimilation is. A very closely related topic, uh, concept, acculturation. Acculturation is the process of disruptive and massive cultural change involving an element of force occurring in a society when it experiences intensive contact with more powerful society. That's acculturation. And then we have a third, final, a third concept that I'd like to introduce you to, and that's forced or directed assimilation. And this is when an, a dominant group attempts to destroy a culture or a tribal group or, um, and forces them to adopt to the dominant culture. Uh, for example, banning native religion, uh, languages, and customs. Uh, now let's uh, look at the legal principles relating to Alaska Natives and the federal Indian policies. And why do we want to do this? Because to understand sociocultural change and assimilation among Native people, it's important to understand the legal realities and the policies that promoted change in the lives of Alaska Natives. Previously, anthropologists have studied environment. They looked at environment. How did environment affect uh, Native society, Indigenous societies? Well, in more recent times, and the recent times now is not so recent, but 20, 30 years ago, we began to look at the political realities and how the, larger, the rules of the larger societies affected uh, indigenous groups. Uh, more often, it's assumed that indigenous groups are passive recipients, that they just kind of meekly go along uh, with the uh, changes that are going on in their life. Uh, more often in Alaska, uh, Alaska Natives were not able to overcome the coercive, the very strongly coercive uh, forces of change that the federal government undertook, and notably that's in the area of land. Uh, but the history of Native people challenges the assumption that they were passive recipients. In reality, they took many initiatives to control the influences that were impacting on their society while they also openly embraced other kinds of changes. This is an important thing to remember. Uh, but first of all, let's remember also that Alaska Native people were originally independent. They were self-sustaining. They were able to uh, provide for themselves in their traditional cultures and economies. However, in the last 270 years since the arrival of Westerners, and the historical and the ongoing interactions with Westerners, the Tlingit and Haida have been very clear and consistent in maintaining that they were the owners of Southeast Alaska. The uh, Tlingit and Haida also had well-established uh, commercial relationship with the Indians in the interior, and they traded all along the coast uh, to, uh, to the northern uh, areas of the Oregon coast. 
And so when the Westerners arrived, they were familiar with the uh, commercial trade and they openly embraced and welcomed the arrival of the Westerners for the trading uh, opportunities that they brought. Um, the first legal principle I'd like to introduce to you is the principle of discovery. And this is a, a legal principle that the uh, civilized nations of the world adopted and they said that the first nation that uh, discovered an indigenous society in the Western Hemisphere had the right of discovery. But I'd also like to note that Native people were not involved in the development of these European agreements. And the resulting legal theory that was developed meant that their interests were not uh, protected. And uh, the principle of discovery held that tribes had right of possession, but not ownership of their lands. These possessory rights could be transferred uh, changed or extinguished only by the discovery nation or in the case of, of Alaska where the discovery nation uh, purchased uh, or sold to the United States the right, the discovery right. And this nation was then uh, expected to extinguish the aboriginal title or Indian title. Now just looking very quickly at the federal uh, native relationship, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall was the first to really uh, uh, look at American Indians and he was the first that uh, uh, made some decisions and they're called the Marshall Trilogy uh, decisions and they established Aboriginal land title, the federal trust responsibility, and then also the inherent governmental powers of Indians. He made decisions in three cases, they're called the Marshall Trilogy. And it's these three judicial decisions that continue to serve as the basis of dealing with Alaska Natives. Also important to know is that under the principles of law established by the U.S. Supreme Court, Congress is said to have plenary powers over Native American communities and their members. And plenary powers means that Congress has full or complete power in the field of Indian affairs. And then I've cited the two provisions of the Constitution uh, that gives them this right, the Indian Commerce uh, Clause and also the Supremacy Clause. And this is important for us to know here in Alaska that laws enacted with, within the scope of constitutional, constitutional authority are the supreme law of the land and preempt contrary provisions of state constitution or laws. In Alaska, we see this operating in uh, ANILCA, the Alaska Native, La land Interest, Alaska Native Interest Land Conservation Act, and over in the area of subsistence, where um, uh, the federal law recognizes the protection of Native subsistence rights, but the state doesn't. So we have the Suprem Supremacy Clause at work for Alaska Natives in this area. Uh, also important to remember is that there is this trust relationship between the federal government and native tribes. And you very often hear about, talk about this legal relationship called trust, uh, trust uh, responsibilities. The United States has a trust responsibility towards Alaska natives. Um, in looking at federal Indian policy, we see that it's been a vacillating pendulum. On the one hand, we'll see uh, where the government attempts to protect Native life, and then uh, a couple of years later, or the next year, we'll see where they try to extinguish a Native culture and then promote assimilation. Uh, now, what was the Clinkett reaction to colonial rule? In 1867, when Alaska was purchased by, uh, by the United States, the Clinkets were fully aware of that. They met. A uh, group of clan leaders met. They were trying to figure out what are we going to do. Some of the clan leaders wanted to advocate for war, while others said, nope, I don't think we have the military might to, uh, to win that war. And so they, they decided not to go to war, but they did hire uh, a lawyer and to protect and advance their rights. The next thing that we see in history is the Clinkett's claim to sovereignty. And this is a case that the Clinkett's brought uh, to court in Risa Kwa in 1886. And here the Clinkett's argued that as an original group, 
they retain their internal governing authority exclusive of the laws of the United States. And the Clinkets here assert that the federal laws prohibiting slavery did not apply to them because, first of all, they were independent sovereigns, and secondly, that their customs allowed for uh, slaveholding. The Alaska Federal District Court rejected the Clinkett assertion uh, that, they were, uh, that they were sovereign and possessed the authority to maintain the practice of slavery. Uh, the court held that as residents of the United States, they were subject to the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibiting slavery. I imagine that, the Clinkett's bringing a law case like that. Uh, with the dismissal of uh, their claims of sovereignty, the Clinkets sought citizenship. And they, in their, uh, the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Sisterhood, they organized to seek their civil rights. And um, they, saw, they saw that because they were not sovereigns, that they would have to become members of this political system in order to try to protect their rights. In 1923, we have Charlie Jones of Wrangell going to vote along, assisted by his aunt uh, Tilly, or Tilly Tamary, of, and they were charged, or they were indicted for voting illegally. William L. Paul Sr., a uh, Clinkett lawyer, uh, comes to the defense of his uncle and his mother, and the case was dismissed thereby uh, validating the right of Alaska Natives to vote. And this was years, a year before the actual 1924 Indian Citizenship uh, Act of 1924 was enacted. So what, what you're seeing here is where the Clinket people are using the institution of the larger society to protect themselves. Uh, another thing that they did was they started to go to court. And in this case, uh, we have Miller versus the United States in 1947. We see uh, individual Clinkets occupying land here in the Juneau area, and they're contesting the condemnation proceedings of their land. Uh, the United States argued that their land was unrecognized aboriginal title and that the United States could extinguish their title without compensation. Sounds very much like the next case that we'll see. The next case is the uh, Teton, and here we see William Paul again acting, and under his leadership, the Teton clan uh, out of Wrangell claims the right to compensation under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution for the value of timber taken by the federal government with the creation of the Tongass National Forest. The Supreme Court, and we heard last week um, Chris McNeil, the CEO and, uh, of Sea Alaska, talk about the Teoton uh, case. And uh, the, this, in this case, the Supreme Court rules that the Teoton clan did not have any permanent rights to land occupied by them. And again, they uh, ruled that the federal taking of unrecognized Aboriginal title was not co uh, compensable under the Fifth Amendment uh, of the Constitution. But it left open the question of whether Alaska Natives had any claims to lands that they occupied. I just add this side note of William L. Paul. You know, William L. Paul was a very significant person in the lives uh, of Alaska Natives. Uh, he not only was uh, uh, acting in southeast Alaska, but he also wrote to the North Slope Inupiat and told them to file a blanket claim for the whole North Slope. In my mind and in my studies of Alaska Native history, it is my assertion that he should be recognized as the father of the Alaska Native land claims. And then we have the uh, Clink and Haida land claims course in 19... Uh, 29, the Clinkets, you know, after, at this time we're hearing a lot of protests of Native people about the taking of their land. They're protesting to the federal government. Nothing ever happened. So in 1929, the ANB uh, passes a resolution that says that they're going to move for the settlement of their aboriginal uh, land claims. And in order to be able to sue the United States government, they had to pass a jurisdictional act, which, which was enacted in 1935. And this allows the indigenous people of Southeast Alaska to sue the United States government for the taking of their aboriginal lands. 
uh, the Court of Claims in this instance ruled for the Tlingit people and the Haida people and said that they had been deprived of their Aboriginal land by the action of the United States and they concluded that uh, they had use and occupancy rights and that they had not, these rights had not been extinguished by the Treaty of Session. And they ruled that they were compensated just over $7 million for the taking of Tongass and uh, Glacier Bay. We'd gladly pay that back today and get those lands back. Uh -huh. Then the other thing that happened was the Indian Reorganization Act. And I, I note in here, this is the first time that the United States government employs anthropologists or social scientists to try to help the United States figure out how do we assimilate these Alaska, uh, Alaska uh, American Indians. And the uh, anthropologists came up with the idea that we should shift the initiative of change, shift the initiative of change to Native people themselves, rather than having the federal government um, you know, use these all of the coercive you know, uh, forces that they were trying to use to change Native people, like war. And they said under the IRA that this was to be accomplished through the adoption of democratic forms of government and also business corporations. The, so we say that the IRA was a kinder and gentler approach to promote change among uh, American Indians, and it replaces the previously coercive policies to assimilate Indians and eradicate tribalism. Uh, it was a, a significant paradigm shift from the individualistic 19th century policies to the collective collectivist reforms of the 20th century. Now, irrespective of the government's objectives, the Clinkett and Haida of Southeast Alaska saw the IRA. They noted that it had not been extended to Alaska Natives, and they began to organize and work through the A and B to, uh, to lobby to have the IRA extended to Alaska Natives. They were especially interested in the federally chartered businesses that had access to a revolving loan fund for economic development. So the important thing about the IRA is to remember that it was, again, a, a creature of Congress. These IRAs were created by Congress. Uh, we're hearing a lot of revisionist history today. But uh, in fact, uh, it was a creature of the United States government. And, but the Native people in Southeast Alaska really liked what they saw, and they lobbied to amend uh, the IRA, which they were successful in doing in 1936, and it was extended to, uh, to Alaska. And so by, by 1948, 41, we have 38 groups that are organized under, under the IRA, the Constitution, and also um, many of them established business charters. And in Southeast Alaska, we see 15 uh, IRAs were established here in Southeast Alaska. Um, so in 1943, the Department of Interior announced plans to set up reserves at Klawak, Cake, and Heidelberg. But over on the western, shore, western parts of Alaska, the department was attempting to prevent non-native people from fishing on the Karlik reserves. A, a group of salmon uh, cannery packers brought suit in the Heinz versus Grimes Packing Company, challenging the department's authority to issue the fishing regulations and also the legality of the reserve itself. The Supreme Court upheld the department's authority to establish the reserves, but they prohibited criminal prosecution of non-native trespassers and characterize the Carlock Reserve as a temporary withdrawal. Um, the decision negated the department's ability to enforce exclusive native fishing rights on the IRA, on the IRA, R, IRA reserves and called into question the permanent rights that native people had to these reserves. A subsequent Alaska federal court case uh, invalidated the Heidelberg Reserve on technical grounds, and it also went uh, further and denounced the department's effort to protect Aboriginal title. 
By 1952, the Department uh, Secretary uh, Ickes and others in the de Interior Department who had supported these reservation programs were no longer in office. And we see the Indian policy pendulum beginning to swing in the reverse direction to the termination of the special Indian uh, native relationship. Uh, so it's against this background, against this historical background, that we see uh, Native people beginning to organize to settle their aboriginal land claims. Uh, because they had had such poor experiences with the BIA, uh, particularly with the business enterprises organized under the IRA corporate structure, and then also they, knowing that the uh, reserves could be revoked, the Native leaders of Southeast Alaska were, were not inclined to, re, uh, to support the reservation system that would be held in trust under, uh, under, under the, this uh, reservation lands. They also said that they did not want to be second-class citizens uh, and uh, living on reservations, and at the time they thought that they would actually be restricted to the reservation land. Alaska Natives clearly wanted to have ownership and control of their lands. So uh, we, we begin the, the issue, uh, we begin to see Native people organizing to enact ANCSA, and we could see the two differences here. Congress really wanted to have clear title to Alaska because uh, it was necessary for economic development. They also wanted to terminate that trust relationship and they wanted to assimilate Alaska Natives, which they thought they would be able to do with fee simple title, uh, cash settlement, and the corporate structure that would individualize uh, the tribal members. Native people, on the, other hand, had, on the other hand, wanted ownership of their land and they rejected the BIA control uh, of their lands. Uh, we also looked at the uh, conflicting values. And we look at Western society and we see that individualism is, is a strong cultural value. Uh, they see land as a commodity. And the transfer of land or property is through inheritance or purchase. Well, uh, Native people, on the other hand, had a communal orientation rather than the individualistic orientation. Uh, they said that land embodies the social, cultural, and spiritual dimensions. And they also transferred land uh, through the generations by tribal membership. If you were a member of a clan or of a tribe, you owned land because of that membership, not because you inherited uh, the property. Go ahead. Um, so language in um, the ANCSA held that its objective was to promote the social and economic welfare of Alaska Natives. We have 12 or 13 regional corporations established and some 200 village corporations. We also have the conveyance of 44 million acres of land and a billion dollars. ANCSA also extinguished uh, aboriginal hunting and fishing rights but the Conference Committee of Congress was very clear in saying that uh, Congress intended to protect subsistence, and uh, this became a reality in uh, the 1980 Alaska National Interest Conservation Act. Um, so we have the passage in 1971, but by the 1980s, the Alaska Native people began to realize the flaws and the dangers of ANCSA. In 1982, we have the AFN convention meeting and the delegates direct AFN to make the 1991 issue its top priority. Uh, the 1991 reference was to the provision in ANCSA that would allow for the lifting of the restrictions on the sale of stock in 1991. Alaska Natives had become increasingly concerned that they could lose their lands with the sale of stock to non-Natives or through taxation and bankruptcy. They also had other concerns with ANCSA, notably uh, the fact that their children who were born after 1971 were excluded as shareholders. 
uh, AFN convened a series of Native leadership retreats and also seven conventions to address these issues and also to develop proposals to amend ANCSA. Uh, the 1984 retreat that was held in Kotzebue was really very interesting in that this, this retreat, the Native people began to identify what are the Native values that we want to protect through ANCSA. And the first one that they identify is a communal orientation. And they said this communal orientation is based on our extended kinship system and the sharing of resources including collectively raising children. This is one I hadn't known about, was that they saw it was a communal responsibility uh, to raise children. They also talked about the respect that they had to have for elders and also that, um, um, that sharing was a bond. It served to unite Native people in this communal, uh, communal group that they, that they uh, lived in. They also identified land as a, an important uh, value. And they viewed their relationship to the land very much like how they viewed their kinship relationship. And they said that subsistence was necessary for not only for their physical well-being, but also their spiritual well-being. And they also said that they have a trust obligation to pass their um, land on to their children. And then the third uh, Native value they identified was Native identity. They said this is a significant Native value. Uh, so these values are the ones that became the basis for the development of the amendments uh, that they were going to bring to Congress. But we have Secretary of the Interior, Hodel, opposing the Native amendments. And he outlines very clearly what his opposition was based on. He said, uh, we have the primacy of individual rights over group rights. Uh, he was opposed to the automatic extension of stock restrictions that would allow for the protection of native lands. After all, uh, ANCSA was meant to be an assimilationist uh, model. And he also said that if you issued stock to, the, to natives born after 1971, it would dilute the value of uh, settled the settlement for existing shareholders. So um, these, the 1991 amendments were adopted and uh, signed into law in 1988. It, its basic provisions called for the protection of land and also native control of the corporations. It uh, restricted the sale of stock. It also provided, had provisions whereby stock could be issued to natives born after 1971 and also to left outs, those who had missed the enrollment, uh, many of them who had been serving in the military. It also recognized another native value and that was caring for the elders and so it said it allowed them to uh, issue uh, stock to elders or else to set up settlement trusts. Uh, AFN was not able to secure the tribal option which would have allowed for the transfer of uh, native corporation lands to an IRA or to a traditional native council. Um, Congress was, was, was adamantly opposed to this, but native people were able to, uh, to secure a disclaimer clause that ensured that the amendments, the 1991 amendments, would not validate or invalidate the existence of Indian country or that a native institution does not have governmental authority over lands or individuals within Alaska. So it was trying to say that the 1991 amendments was maintaining the status quo. But as I noted, it did recognize um, Alaska native communal rights, the protection of land ownership, and the rights of children to land ownership and their identity as Alaska Natives. Um, Native corporations went a little bit further and this, uh, they secured the right, to, a legislative right to have consultation where the federal government would meet with, uh, with, with ANCs as tribes uh, to whenever they were talking about issues that would affect Alaska Native, uh, Alaska Native corporations. And this was a result of when the pipeline, they were doing the reauthorization of the pipeline. 
uh, and they were they were not consulting with the ANCs, but rather with the tribes. The ANCs were the owners of the land, so uh, Native leaders went to Congress and and were able to secure a legislative requirement for consultation. Uh, they have also gone to Congress a number of times and have secured 117 federal acts that say that Native corporations are tribes for special statutory purposes, not for the uh, purposes of governance, but for these special uh, statutory purposes. Uh, we also see ANCs acting to protect uh, uh, Native cultures. They provide financial and political support to AFN to advocate uh, on behalf of Alaska Natives. They create and support cultural foundations and uh, importantly, uh, it's been said that they provided up to $20 million for the protection of subsistence. So the question that we now have before us is, has ANCSA been a vehicle of assimilation of Alaska Natives into Western society, or has it been a vehicle uh, for cultural survival? So when we look at ANCSA, we see that land was the major provision and the form of ownership and use was transformed under the settlement. Additionally, uh, Alaska Natives secured title to only about 12% of the lands that they once owned. Uh, land was transferred to Native corporations under fee simple title, and land held under fee simple title had the potential to facilitate change in Native society. If we look at their traditional economy, we see that land and the natural resources were traditionally used for food and utilitarian purposes, and also the arts and crafts uh, could be sold, or the byproducts of subsistence resources could be uh, uh, sold as a source of cash. But ANCs, as profit-making entities, use land for economic purposes to generate financial capital. Uh, it's also important to note that ANCSA also selected historic and sacred sites for their cultural rather than their commercial values. Looking at Southeast Alaska, we can see that of the 23 million acres in Southeast Alaska, Alaska Native corporations have harvested a total of 340,000 acres of land or 1.5% of the total land base. So, Although we have these commercial developments uh, of ANC lands, uh, and we, we see that it does have uh, impacts on the land and the environment, the data does not indicate that commercial activities on ANC lands have been diminished or replaced by the, or replaced the subsistence economy. The existence of dual economies in rural Alaska is well established. Uh, we know that subsistence is a, an important indicator of the persistence of traditional culture, and we see this particularly in the rural communities. Uh, ANCs have been at the forefront in expending a political and economic capital to protect subsistence. We can assume that subsistence rights would have been seriously undermined had not uh, the ANCs used their financial and political capital su to support subsistence. Uh, we also see that ANCSA, ANCSAs have largely maintained their land ownership of lands except for home sites. And in Southeast Alaska, we have two village corporations establishing the home sites. and. Um, when we looked at the data uh, more than 10 years ago, I haven't had a chance to update this part yet, we see that 40% of these home sites have been sold to non-natives and lost to native ownership. Um, now, insofar as the capital economy, we see that from first contact, Alaska Native people eagerly sought uh, the benefits of the capital economy. And the legislative history of ANCSA also reveals that Native leaders saw ANCSA as a means to develop the capital economy in their communities and in which they would become owners of the businesses. During the 1970s and 80s, we see Alaska Natives, particularly women, uh, moving into the uh, workforce 
largely as a result of the oil pipeline and also the state uh, capital funding uh, capital projects in rural communities. The state is coming into a lot of uh, money at this point in time and so they have a lot of capital projects in rural Alaska and this is where Native people are going to work. Um, during the same period we see ANCs increasing their employment. However, even with the uh, shareholder preference priority, we see that in the early years that most of the employment uh, particularly in the professional positions went to non-native people. But as native people are increasingly becoming educated, they're moving now into uh, these professional positions. However, during the last decade, uh, we've seen a decreasing uh, availability, availability of wage jobs in rural Alaska, leading to an out-migration from the villages to the urban centers which conceivably could have an adverse impact on Native culture. Uh, sea Alaska has promoted, has uh, formed Ha'ani to form, uh, to promote economic opportunities in rural communities that we hope will attract Native people uh, back to their home communities or allow them to remain in their homeland. Now, Here's something I'd like to bring to you. Uh, a, I suggest that the adoption of a resolution to allow for the issuance of stock to Native people born after 1971 is a significant indicator of assimilation, measuring the adoption of Western values and norms or the persistence of Native cultural values. Corporate stock is acquired through a purchase, gifting, or inheritance, but not generally given without a payment. Non-native corporations do not give away thousands of, of, of give away stock to thousands of new shareholders by a vote of their stockholders. In the ANC case, individual stockholders are asked to vote on a resolution to allow natives born after 1971 to receive stock without any payment in the face of diluting the value of their individual stock. Now I realize that this is a very simple, you know, simple uh, assertion about a very complex issue, but I also argue that it offers a very concrete measure about the persistence of group values versus the individual values. In voting to give stock to uh, natives born after 71, the individual shareholder is asked to choose between group rights of native societies or individual rights of Western societies. Four regional corporations have adopted this resolution, including ASRC, DOYA, NANA, and Sea Alaska. And they voted to provide stock to children born after 1971. <laughs> Uh, these ANCs have also replicated a form of tribal membership uh, by making the enrollment of succeeding generations of Native people perpetual. Uh, in Southeast Alaska, in conformance with our traditional value of Hashigun that recognizes our, our ties to our ancestors and also to our future generations, um, shareholders voted in two 2007 with more than 56 percent of the outstanding shares to enroll Alaska Natives who were born after 1971. Moreover, they voted to extend this in perpetuity. The persistence of these cultural values was again demonstrated in 2009 when the shareholders went again to the poll, and in this instance, by an overwhelming vote of 76%, they vote to give additional shares to elders. And this follows on an earlier action that set up a trust, or set up funds, rather, uh, to give each elder uh, $2,000 upon the age of reaching uh, 65. So clearly, these are native values. So looking at the cultural persistence of Alaska Natives, we could see that indeed, there's no doubt about it, that they have adopted many of the, the patterns and norms of the American society. However, it is equally, equally clear that they have not abandoned their traditional, their cultural traditions. 
On the contrary, Alaska Natives living in both rural and urban communities are initiating uh, efforts to revitalize their languages and culture. And uh, we see that the Alaska Native corporations have provided uh, considerable financial assistance to allow, to, to try to support these efforts. Uh, in Southeast Alaska, we see the persistence of a clan system. And we see that they have a very active ceremonial life uh, with thousands uh, participating in the annual round of memorial uh, traditional rites. In, the, in these ceremonies, again, in contrast to Western society, we see where, where a hosting clan will distribute up to $50,000 in cash to the guest clans. In, a, in addition to that, they may distribute up to another $50,000 in goods uh, to the guests. Uh, and they also serve an enormous amount of subsistence and commercial foods to the hundreds of people who will go to these um, uh, ceremonies. So in conclusion, we see that Alaska Natives have been changing since their first contact with Westerners in 19, 1741. They have adopted many of the cultural norms and practices but they have also retained a signif uh, significant elements of their traditional values and practices. Uh, we also recognize that indeed sociocultural differences exist among Alaska Natives. There are some who are immersed uh, in their traditional culture, while we have other Alaska Natives uh, who rarely, if at all, participate in uh, traditional activities. But overall, Alaska Natives maintain elements of their traditional culture, which are distinctly different uh, from the larger societies. Alaska Natives have also maintained the special legal rights that they have as, uh, that set them apart from other, other, uh, other citizens. They remain distinct not only as a racial group, but also as a political group that has been recognized by the courts and Congress. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that Alaska Native corporations are but one institutions that are affecting the lives of Alaska Native societies and stimulating sociocultural change. Uh, ANCSA has not been the sole stimulus of sociocultural change and uh, their assimilation into Western society, but through their political advocacy and their uh, financial support of cultural programs, they have contributed to the survival of Native culture. Uh, Congress enacted ANCSA to promote assimilation, but ironically, it also enacted into law a traditional value of sharing through a form of what I call corporate socialism. And this is embodied in Section 7i and 7j of ANCSA. Uh, 7, 7i calls for the sharing of 70% of profits that are derived from uh, subsurface and timber development. And then 7j outlines the distribution formula among the regional corporations and the village corporations and also at large shareholders. Um, corporate sharing was actually initiated by Alaska Native people themselves. I know this might come as a surprise to many people who say this was imposed on them, but a memo I found uh, says that it was Native people that uh, enacted or promoted the Section 7i. And under 7i, we see that $1.4 billion has been uh, shared among the Alaska-based ANCs. For Southeast Alaska or Sea Alaska Corporation, that's meant that they've distributed over $300 million. And more recently, we're starting to get back money as other regions are developing uh, their subsurface resources. And the price of gold and oil has helped out here. And so Sea Alaska has received uh, $359 million. ANCSA has been amended multiple times to accommodate the needs and desires of Alaska Natives, and undoubtedly it will be amended to accommodate uh, the further changing needs of Alaska Natives. The history of Alaska Native corporations in the last 40 years demonstrates that Alaska Native corporations 
our evolving institutions. Good luck, Tish. <laughs> Ten minutes to answer, ask any questions of Albert. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 